Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a brand new ranking. This month, I saw 11 movies in the month of October here in 2020. Amazing to see that many movies in a month where you can't go to the theaters. So before we get into my ranking, leave me your ranking in the comments section down below. What are your least favorite, favorite movies? If you haven't seen some of these movies, that's also okay. Some of the movies that you have seen, if I have missed any that you have seen so far in this month, just please, please, please let me know in the comment section. I will also please like the video. I'll tell you more about some more upcoming videos at the end of this review. Now, because this is 11 movies, this will be a bit of a longer video, so definitely stay tuned for that. And also, all 11 of these movies I've already reviewed in nine to 10 minute, nine to 12 minute videos already. So you guys can check for all of those links at the end of the video. But if you want my full reviews, you can go to those, uh, my videos there. But here, I'll be my small snippet reviews for each of the movies. So as you can tell, my least favorite movie of the month at number 11 is A Babysitter's Guide to Monster Hunting. Um, a movie that I saw very early in the month of October. I think the second movie I saw this month, and I really just didn't really enjoy this movie. I gave it a 1.5 out of five. Um, the only actually below average movie I believe I saw in the month. Um, I'll tell you more about this. There's a lot of average movies that I saw, but I saw this is the only below average one. And I just didn't really enjoy myself as much as I wanted to. Um, the movie wants to be really fun, exciting, but at times it's a little too over the top. Uh, common sense, again, is really thrown out the door, and there's so many subplots going on. I did enjoy Tom Felton's role as the main villain, the boogeyman of the movie, and the actual plot at the first beginning of the movie was actually cool, but our main character just gets accustomed to becoming a monster hunter very, very quickly. She doesn't, she seems like this is all coming natural to her, and it just didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I wasn't scared at all. Um, the ending was also extremely disappointing for this movie. And they really tried to shoehorn in a possible sequel in the final 10 minutes, which I didn't really enjoy as well. So again, the movie, it's not the worst in the world. I do like uh, three of these performances in here, especially Felton, who's doing a very over-the-top performance, but he knows what movie he is in. But the fact that they shoehorned a sequel, it wasn't as scary as I think it should have been. It was trying to be like a goosebumps, but it just wasn't. So that's why it's my number 11 movie of the month. Coming in at number 10 is actually the most recent movie on Netflix that I checked out. I reviewed this movie on Wednesday, and that is The Holiday, which stars Emma Roberts and Luke Bracey. Um, I gave this 2.5 out of 5. I feel like this was just meh. Um, it's going to be a very forgettable movie when this year wraps up The Holiday, very similar to a couple of her rom-coms on Netflix that I've seen this year, like Love Guaranteed, for example. And actually, I enjoyed these cast members really, really a lot. Roberts is actually the best she's been in a while here in a lead role in this movie. I shall really enjoy Luke Bracey as well. They have good chemistry, but this movie has, is trying to do a lot going on. Uh, there's so many subplots involving Emma Roberts' family that gets shoehorned in. King Batch has a subplot because he's friends with Luke Bracey. And there's a little too much to care about because you really, if the movie centrally focused on our two characters here, then the movie would have worked a lot better. But it tries to give Emma Roberts' sister a whole plot. They try to give Emma Roberts' aunt a whole routine. They try to give her mom a whole subplot. King Batch has a subplot. There is so much going on. And the movie is trying to be really raunchy. There's a lot of F-bombs. Um, there's a lot of curse words. And a lot of those jokes just fell really flat. I felt like the movie was trying to force to be a rated R rating just to curse. And it didn't really make a whole lot of sense why it was R. It really just needed to be PG-13. And it wasn't as funny as it should have been. It was really trying to be a rom-com throughout. And then the ending felt way too cheesy. And the movie actually felt pretty real, like it could really happen. And then the ending happens and you feel like you're back in a movie template of a rom-com. But I don't hate the movie. I think there's, the actors are really good in it. Emma Roberts and Luke Bracey characters I actually enjoy and felt very relatable to those characters. But as a whole, the movie tries to have way too much going on and becomes too cheesy at the end of the day. My number nine movie of the month is Hubie Halloween, which a lot of people are really not liking on Netflix. Now, I did have more fun with this than most people because I expect what this movie is going to be. Um, Sandler and his friend making a fun movie for an hour and a half. And I, it, was, it wasn't harmful for me. Is this a good movie? Not even close to the imagination. But is this one of the worst movies of the year? Is this one of the worst Halloween movies of all time? Definitely not. There is some fun to have in this movie because this movie's cast is too good. We have Adam Sandler, of course, playing Hubie in the lead. But then you have Julie Bowen, Kevin James, Maya Rudolph, um, 
Meadows uh, is in here as well. There's so many, so many cats. But Noah Schnepp, Shaq is also in here. There's just Buscemi, Schneider. They're all in here. And I have fun for the most part in this movie. Um, again, the plot is so ridiculous. And I hated what they did with the ending. Um, if what's so out of left field, so ridiculous. Um, but Hubie is a pretty relatable character. She, he's, even though, now a problem for Hubie for me is that you really can't understand a thing he says for a lot of the movie. Sandler's having fun with the role, but at times you can't understand a thing he is saying. There's a big twist about who that, the actual villain of the movie is who's taking all these kids. And you can kind of see coming a mile away. And the movie tries to give you a message and, give, and make it heartfelt and emotional towards the third act, but it doesn't, it doesn't embody that whatsoever. And the movie just should have stuck to his ridiculousness throughout instead of having pieces that are trying to be really emotional and have a message to kids. So it was really interesting because it's not really a kid's movie. There's a lot of inappropriate jokes. For some reason, it's trying to reach kids. It's a weird movie. I did have fun with it because of this cast is so funny to watch on screen. And Shaq's bit had me dying laughing. But the movie as a whole is done very poorly. It's a bit of a mess. And it feels like Sandler tried to get too many of his friends in this movie at once. There's too much going on. So again, QB Halloween is my number nine. We're going to go a fast, guys. As I said, pretty fast. And the next movie on my list is Rebecca, which was on Netflix. Um, I, I was, this is probably the most disappointed I've been with a movie in this month. I always thought that this would be a top tier of Netflix on the year, possibly, with Army Hammer and Lily James. But it just isn't. Uh, first of all, these two cast members do a great job in the lead role. This is based off the book and then the 1940 adaptation of the Hitchcock Best Picture winner. And this movie is the first 20 minutes are exactly what I want it to be. Great, great romance shot on a really well location. The movie shot very beautifully. Hammer and James do a great job in their respective roles. But once you go to the Hammer's estate and things start to unravel about who Rebecca was, what, who actually killed Rebecca, she did, did she kill herself via drowning? Did Army Hammer kill her? Um, but the mystery itself, the script thinks it's this epic, fascinating story that everyone should care about, and that's very emotional, but it isn't. The movie feels like it's this grand, that score is epic. When the stuff is being revealed, it feels the movie thinks it's epic, and it's, it, it is not. Um, the, the story is actually pretty boring, and I didn't care about the story whatsoever. I didn't care about the mystery. Most of these people in the movie are actually bad people, so why would you want a bad person to possibly win in this case? Um, and Lily James makes a huge character decision that is so not her character in the first half of the movie. And then she just sticks to it the rest of the movie and it didn't make a, a lot of sense. I was really disappointed with this movie. Again, well-directed, well-shot, great acting, but the story itself is pretty, pretty bad and very boring for a two hour plus movie. Next is HBO Max's Witches, which I also have checked out this month. Um, I felt Witches was just meh again, another meh movie for the month of October. Um, Anne Hathaway, Octavia Spencer, Stanley Tucci um, do their part. Um, I, again, never saw the, read, never, never read the book, never saw the 1990 movie, so came into this movie blind as can be. Um, Octavia Spencer for me is probably the best character and best performance of the entire film. She felt the most relatable character if you if you're in this situation um Anne Hathaway is very over the top and I don't love her Russian accent but Anne Hathaway out of everyone here again knows what movie she is in and she does a good job too she's basically like a cameo he pops in here and there but his character is so limited with this Zemeckis movie which is also written by Del Toro and it's produced by Koran so big people on this movie my biggest issue was the kids themselves not their fault but the script once they turn into rats, it's like they already know how to become, to be a rat. And that's not how it would be if I would have turned into a rat. It would be tough to find out what to do with myself and how to move and that type of stuff. But it, I mean, it clicked for them really fast on how to be a rat. And then it tried to really hit home a message about it doesn't matter what you look like, you'll be loved by whoever. And this movie did not need a message in it. Uh, I know it was really trying to. I'm not sure if the book did or the other movie did, but this movie really tried to shoehorn in a message that I wasn't feeling whatsoever. Um, I get the part about race in this movie, which is done very well with Octavia Spencer's character and this very fancy white hotel. But as a whole, the other witches felt so meaningless. Anne Hathaway is a character who I enjoy in Hathaway, but her character was written so poorly that 
I didn't feel her to be any threat to the kids or Octavia Spencer. So I didn't take her character that seriously. So which was a, not, not a disappointing movie, the movie I thought it would be an average, another miss from Robert Zemeckis. Now let's go into some above average movies. The first movie that I saw in the month of October, I think October 2nd or 3rd, and that is a Netflix movie called Vampires vs. the Bronx. Um, I really, and now we found out that the kid who starred in this movie, um, he's playing young Colin Kaepernick in the Netflix doc, so good for him. But I actually found a lot of more fun than I thought I would in this movie. Um, it's a really fun Halloween movie. Out of all the movies this month, this really does feel like a Halloween type of movie. Um, I really, really actually enjoyed myself in watching this movie. The kids have great chemistry with each other. They have great on-screen um, presence with themselves. But as a whole, the movie does struggle with terrible CGI, terrible prosthetic work. It feels like this movie was made in the early 2000s with the, the way that the vampires move. Um, that stuff is there, but the actual kids and the storylines going on in their lives actually worked a lot. There's one kid with a storyline about joining a gang that I did not think was necessary. Oh, but you're rooting for the kids to succeed. You're rooting for this town to get rid of these vampires. For sure. So I enjoyed this movie. I had, I thought it was fine. Nothing special or anything. It wasn't a good movie, but I thought it was a fine movie. An easy breeze, 90 minute on Netflix. Uh, let's keep moving with Borat 2. Uh, the only prime movie on this list. I enjoyed Borat 2 for what it was. Um, I, I really liked the first one. The second one is also, just for me, not as good as the first one. And the main difference for me between the two is that the first one, I was laughing continuously throughout the entire runtime. This movie, there were too many breaks of, of screen time where I wasn't laughing whatsoever. And I also felt like this movie was way too political. And the ending of a joke about a possible spreading of, of covid uh, by Borat just did not work for me whatsoever. It felt very out of touch. But as a whole, Sasha Baron Cohen delivers a really good performance again as Borat. The daughter, uh, I forgot her name, but she does a, also a phenomenal job. They have great chemistry. It's tough to be Borat's daughter, and she does a really, really good job. And her storyline, even when Borat is on screen, is also very, very interesting. Again, some of the stuff you can't believe was shot during this pandemic and would move to film. All these big skits are really, really good from Borat. But as a whole, I didn't enjoy this movie nearly as much as the first one, but I still had just enough fun to give me some laughs for a nice 95-minute movie. Uh, so let's keep moving, guys, with this top. I believe we're at the top four now. Yeah, top four now. And that is where we begin with On the Rocks, which I'm going to find. There it is. With Rashida Jones and Bill Murray on Apple TV, plus uh, the Sofia Coppola-directed and written film. I actually really like this movie. Um, Two really good performances. Jones proves herself as a uh, lead actress in Hollywood, in my opinion, with a really endearing, relatable, real performance. As his wife, who's going through a rut in her marriage with Marlon Wayans, she does a very good job in her role. Bill Murray steals the entire movie, and he's, if, if I could vote for the Oscars, I would put him up for Best Supporting Actor. This is the best Bill Murray's been in a very long time. He hasn't had this juicy of a role in a really long time in this type of movie. And you know, him and Coppola have a good connection in past movies like Lost in Translation. So, you know, he's going to be good in it. Uh, but the movie as a whole, it's a very simple story about just trying to tail her husband, make sure Marlon Wayans isn't cheating on him, uh, on her. And it's a very simple story done very, very well and very real and relatable that you feel like this could actually happen to someone. And I actually enjoyed that part. Obviously, I can't relate to it, but I know a lot. It felt very real, like this could actually happen. My issue with the movie was that Marlon Wayans needed a lot more screen time. I didn't really feel the rut in the marriage with Jones and Wayans that much. I got like one or two scenes where that was evident, but for the rest of the movie, it wasn't really like that because Wayans was gone, you know, doing trips, and Rashida Jones was either at home or with Bill Murray. So that was kind of the main difference with that uh, movie. And also, as the whole, I wanted to feel a lot more emotional at the end of the movie. I didn't feel emotional whatsoever because I was like, enjoying myself, having fun. And then the ending happened and it was a little too serious and I didn't really care as emotionally as I thought I would when I got to the ending, but it's an easy breeze on Apple TV+. Plus. Now we're going to get into three movies now in my top three that have all now, sorry, that have all now made it into my top 10 of the overall year. So some really good movies in my opinion. The first one 
is Clouds. Uh, Disney Plus movie that I believe is the best Disney Plus original movie that we've gotten so far from the product. Um, it's done so well. And uh, this is the most wrecked I've been, emotionally I've been, in a movie in 2020. Uh, Finn Argus plays the lead character, Zach Sobiak, who basically has cancer and he finds out that he's terminal. He's basically a six to 10 months that he is alive. And you can feel the movie really picking up and you feel each moment matters. And he wants to write the song. And, his, and this is a true story back from 2012, 2013. And once he writes his own song and sings it with his best friend, who's played by Sabrina Carpenter, who you see on screen behind me, the, movie, it, the song becomes a number one hit worldwide on iTunes, on iHeartRadio, like that kind of stuff. It's number one on the charts. So he becomes very famous, but you can feel all the tension. He does, I mean, one of the most heartbreaking scenes was the fact that he was having to write a college essay about what he wants to do in college, and he knows he won't get to college. This movie really, really wrecked me. Uh, during quarantine, actually, this is a pretty touching movie about how much time we actually have and how much we can do, how much we can make a difference in the world in such a small amount of time. Zach did so much uh, before he... He lived such a small amount of time in this world, but did so much for the world, making songs, um, donating money, having this relationship with his girlfriend, played by Madison Iceman. Um, I, was, I was very close to crying, tears in my eyes at the ending of the movie. I didn't know the story whatsoever. And maybe if you do, you don't, I've heard people say this is a little too depressing, but that's what the story is. And I really felt very real. I cared for most of the characters in here. There were some subplots. They tried to include the entire family of of, of Zach's family and that didn't really work. And it looked like there was some baggage between Nev Campbell and Tom Everett Scott who, who played Finn's, uh, sorry, Zach's parents. And it, it felt very put in there and then it got forgotten about. And then Sabrina Carbon says that she might have liked Zach and then that was forgotten about. But as a whole guys, I really enjoyed Clouds. I would highly recommend you guys check Clouds out on Disney Plus. My number, now these two movies are actually in my top five of the year so far, not just top 10. And coming in at number two of the month, five overall in the year, and that is Over the Moon, which I had just inside my top 10. I was like, I kept thinking about it, and I love this movie. This slid in right into my number five song because this movie is a great animated movie from Netflix who have put on great movies like Klaus and Next Gen. They already had the Willoughby's earlier this year. They are becoming one of the most highly touted animated uh, studios out there, and Over the Moon is really, really done perfectly well. Um, First of all, the cast is all great. And if this, this movie, obviously, a lot of people are comparing it to Coco and the fact that how it respects its culture and takes on a fantasy, uh, heartfelt approach to its culture and its mythologies. And it, it does that very well with this movie. Now, this also is a musical, and I actually like most, if not all, of the songs in the movie. And I'm saying from a guy who doesn't really like musicals that much. I really enjoyed the songs in here. Ken Jeong's dog character stole a lot of the scenes. Philippa Shu, who is from Hamilton, she kills it as that moon goddess. She is uh, right there. She does a great job in the movie singing. Our lead character is very relatable. Um, but again, the movie at times does feel a little too familiar about a parent dying and her and that parent believing in something that no one else believes in, but the kid believes in that. So the movie does feel very familiar. It feels like you've seen a lot of animated movies do that. And you have, it's definitely a knock on the movie. But as a whole, it's even though Onward, I believe, is a better movie than this, I am rooting for Over the Moon at the Academy Awards over Onward. This feels like a great animated movie, and it's in my top five of the year. And coming in number one, guys, this is a long video. Very sorry about that. My number one, we're here in October, and it's not, not just my number one of October, number one of the year, and that is The Trial of the Chicago 7, the true story directed and written by Aaron Sorkin, with my opinion, the cast of the year. Um, we just talked about Sasha Baron Cohen, moments ago. He's fantastic in here. Eddie Renmain, Franklin Hella, Mark Rylance, Michael Keaton, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, Jeremy Strong. This is, this cast is fantastic. It's also very well written by Sork and Joseph Gordon-Levitt's in here as well. He does a great job. Um, but this movie is a very complicated topic that feels very relatable to what's going on in 2020. This movie took place, I mean, the movie, where, where the story took place was like 1968. Very sad to hear that th that's how long this type of stuff's happening. Um, easily the best written movie of the year. Now again, Sorkin isn't the greatest director in my opinion. This easily could have been a better directed movie. But for me, the writing is so, so good. You're rooting for the characters you're supposed to root for. Um, it's a story that I had never even heard of before. And I'm very shocked that no one in my history class has ever taught me about this because this is a very important case. 
and people are, are crapping on the ending. I actually really enjoyed the ending of the movie. So The Trial of Chicago 7 is a really great movie, in my opinion. Should be nominated at the Oscars, and it deserves all the accolades that it is getting right now. It's definitely my favorite movie of the year. So that is my October ranking. I'm sorry it was a long video. It was 11 movies, the most movies I've seen in a month in such a long time. So happy to be busy. And there's so much more coming down the pipe on this YouTube channel. I do Netflix movie reviews. I do whatever this new movie review is dropping. I normally do reviews for those movies. Also, The Mandalorian came out today. I reviewed that spoiler fashion. And every Friday, I'll be doing my spoiler reviews for The Mandalorian. Please uh, follow me on my social medias down in the description down below. Give me your rankings in the comment section down below. Like the video. Do all of those things. Subscribe. Ring the bell. And I'll see you guys in the next one.